Dr. Ana Lucia Lopez Reveredo will be our moderator tonight. And I just want to share a little bit. She is a friend. She is a host. I have known her for a long time. And I'm so excited to welcome her to our to our virtual stage tonight. Uh, Dr. Ana Lucia is a Peruvian, Chilean, Quechua, American Jutina, born in Peru and raised in Spain and the United States, an anti-oppression activist, educator, and also researcher. Ana Lucia founded Jutina Eco in 2019 to offer Latin Jews from around the world a platform in which to celebrate Latin Jewish heritage engage in critical dialogue about identity and nurture a Latin Jewish community partnership, uh, leadership and resilience. And this is our first partnership uh, with you formally in this, in this role in this organization. And I'm just so thrilled that all the years of friendship have brought and learning from you have brought us, um, brought you to this stage, welcome. Thank you so much, Gail. It has a, an absolute pleasure to be able to see this dream that we thought about, I think, last year come to life tonight. And even more so of a dream to be doing this in collaboration with Chef Fanny Gerson, who is just everyone who's here, who's here tonight, you'll get to you'll get the opportunity to meet her in just a second. But what an opportunity to engage in an experience that not only stretches your own understanding of what it means to be a part of a multicultural community, which is the Jewish community, but to also get to see how our traditions play out in different parts of the world tonight in Mexico. So as Gail mentioned, Jutina Ico, one of our, our primary you know, missions is to engage our community in celebrating Latin Jewish heritage. And Mexico is an incredible place to start. If, it's, if this is your first time exploring what Latin Jewry has to offer, what a yummy, what a yummy place to get started. I really do think that. Um, for those of you that don't know, Mexico is home to around 40,000 and 50,000 Jews, making it the 14th largest country that hosts Jews in the world, that's home to Jews in the world. It's characterized it's strongly by its traditionalist communities, ranging from Orthodox to conservative, and its variety of institutions. Talking about Mexican Jewry um, today is primarily comprised of Ashkenazim, Sephardim, and Levantine Jews that left af after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire after uh, post-World War I. Um, it's also considered to be one of the most active Jewish communities in the world. And tonight we get to see just how that activeness has generated some creativity and some um, opportunities for us to engage old world flavors with some new world um, enthusiasm. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start introducing our special guest of the night, which is Chef Fanny Gerson. So as the country's most authoritative voice on Mexican sweets, Fanny Gerson has been featured in the New York Times, Food and Wine, Fine Cooking, Savoy Magazine, Fine Cooking, Fast Company, and New York Magazines, amongst others. She launched an, the acclaimed La New Yorkina, an artisanal Mexican frozen treats and sweet business in 2010. She is also the chef and founder and co-owner of Fan Fan Donuts, an artisan gourmet donut shop. Yum, yum, yum. Now we can, we can understand where it is that this Tres Leches Babka is coming from. <laughs> a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, Fanny has worked in a range of fine dining kitchens around the world, including three Michelin star Aquelare in Spain and 11 Madison Park in New York. She has written three books, My Sweet Mexico, which was also nominated for a James Beard Award in 2010 for Best Baking and Pastry Cookbook. Um, also, she's written Paletas, and Mexican ice cream. Fanny also opened her first brick and mortar for La New Yorkina on October 2006 in the West Village of New York City, was a mentor in the We New York City Women's Leadership Program in 2016, and is, has been recognized as a Latin woman leader in 2017 by El Diario, a very important publication for the Latin community. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to our chef, Fanny Gerson. <laughs> We can give little reactions if you know how to use it. I'm, I'm giving her a hand, uh, some clapping here on Zoom. <laughs> Welcome, Fanny. We're so happy that you're here. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for, you know, such a beautiful introduction. And uh, I'm super excited, you know, about all the work that you've been doing uh, as well. So I'm really looking forward to this. All right. 
Amelie, let's do it. Then, so tell us a little bit more about yourself. I kind of give a little bit of an overview, but I'm curious to know what inspired your lifelong journey, your lifelong affair with food? Uh, So I was born and raised in Mexico. And I think my, you know, love affair with food started, you know, when I was a baby. (laughs) When I turned one, my father wanted to give me something really special. And, uh, you know, he heard from a friend that uh, had given her son, when he turned one, his own cake. You know, the first time he had sugar to do whatever he wanted. Plus, you know, the cake for, for the guests was another story. And so he decided to take that idea and bought me a kilo, which is a little over two pounds of chocolate truffles. Now that's a lot for even an adult. <laughs> and uh, apparently it was sort of like my when my aunt and my grandmother found out, like they went, you know, they went, you know, after him and by the time they got to where I was, there was chocolate all over. I'm sure I didn't get to eat all of those, but you know, basically I've enjoyed and loved food since I can remember. And I was fortunate enough to grow up in one of the best food cities in the in the world. Um, so I think it just started as that, but but later on, you know, when I was, you know, getting ready to apply to schools, uh, you know, when I was in high school, I, you know, cooking was not even a, a thought like that could be a career it wasn't it wasn't what it is now there was there was like I think there were three schools that were doing culinary art which I didn't even know about at the time I didn't know any female chefs um, I didn't know it could be a career I didn't have any mentors there was no food network or you know Netflix or anything like that that you could aspire to um, so I was going to go into art um and then i spent a year in israel because uh, i went to when i studied in mexico i i studied in an international school and i felt i wanted to connect with sort of you know that jewish uh part of of you know who i was i wanted to explore that so i went to to israel and there i met uh i i went to the university of tel aviv for you know a program called the overseas student program and then i lived in a kibbutz for six months and in the kibbutz i met this guy whose mom owned one of those three cooking schools in mexico and that's how i learned about it and i said what so when i told my parents i wanted to go there they they were not (laughs) they were not very happy they did not want me to go they were like they were mortified but the funny thing is is that they actually wanted me to pursue art so it wasn't like, oh, no, we want you to do something practical. <laughs> and uh, that's how that's how it began. OK, and I have to agree. I think agree. I think uh, having you um, saying that you were were born and raised in one of the most impressive cities for culin- the culinary arts and really just kind of discovering like the magic of food. I second that. And I think a lot of people in the audience who have had the opportunity to visit Mexico City would also concur. Yes. So tonight. Tres leches and babka. So many people might know babka. Many people, many others might know tres leches. Few might know the magical combination of these two. So I'm, I'm curious out of all the possibilities, why was this the one you wanted to showcase this evening? So, you know, this, my, my sister, um, who I consider to be like my true best friend, she lives in London. And she uh, has two daughters who love to bake, who love to cook. And the first um, recipe they made out of my my Sweet Mexico cookbook was Tres Leches Cake. Um, then my, the youngest one, Luna, who is five, she is hysterical. And she does this thing called Luna Bakes. And she did a lot of them during the, the pandemic. So every Friday, she would do these, like my sister would record her doing these mostly baking things. So she would always be like, oh, give me an idea of something that I could do. And I've really been missing them. It's been um, like a little over a year and a half since I saw them. And uh, so I wanted to do, I've just been thinking a lot about them all the time. And I, and I keep thinking about what it is that I want to show them how to make. I mean, there's a ton of stuff that we've done, but you know, a lot of it is like who, you know, who, who we are, like what, what is my heritage? And I start to think about, you know, the first thing I wanted to teach my son how to make was tortillas. 
Like that was very important to me, you know, I, because to me, you know, the, the food is what connects you to, to your culture. That's the first thing. And uh, I read this thing once that says, you know, when, when you, uh, you know, migrate and go live somewhere else, you may adopt new customs, you may speak, uh, may, may learn a new language, may even, you know, adopt a new religion or a new belief or something, but food, your food is something you never forget. And so, you know, this is sort of like, okay, this isn't something I grew up with, but, you know, when I moved to, when I was in Mexico, I did not grow up in, you know, as part of the Jewish community, the Jewish community in Mexico is very tightly knit, but if you are not part of it, it, it can be, uh, you know, a, a very unpleasant experience, to be honest, because it's very insular. And uh, so in my school, I was, there were a lot of people, there were a lot of Israelis, but there were just a few, you know, Mexican Jews. And so I was kind of like, the token Jew and, you know, I was a minority. And then when I moved to New York, I was like, oh wait, there's a lot of us here, <laughs> you know? And uh, so I always say sort of being away from home is what's brought me uh, closer to it. So I've done a lot of stuff over the years, you know, kind of, you know, as I explore my own identity, you know, what it is to be Mexican, what it means to be Jewish for me. And so this is a recipe that I immediately thought of that I wanted to do for them, for my nieces, for my sister. And that's the first one that I'm going to do, you know, as soon as I get to see them. It's amazing. I, and I love that analogy you said about you might, as an immigrant, um, you might go far away, you might learn a different language. I love everything. And, and you're right, like food, if I, if I reflect on my own experience, like food is this one thing that I think is a constant. So with that, why don't we get started? Let's, let's, yeah. uh, let's do it. Okay. So first of all, welcome to my, you know, tiny New York kitchen. <laughs> and uh, since I, you know, this is a very like homey setup, I'm just going to be moving, moving the computer because it's just a really tiny space. And uh, my son may pop up, you know, he's three years old. <laughs> he already has his, his dinosaur apron on because he saw me put mine on. So he's, he's ready. He's ready to, to help out. And he actually helped make, you know, because I'm going to do kind of like I, I made some ahead of time so that you could see. Um, anyway, so we're gonna get started. So I, I think you all have the recipe. And if at some point anybody has any questions, uh, just ask, uh, you know, you could either, I guess, unmute yourself or send it through the chat and you can let me know. But um, this is a very fun recipe uh, and you can kind of make it your own. The other thing I do wanna mention is when I, we do this Mexican chocolate babka and Mexican cinnamon uh, babkas that we do for the Jewish holidays at La Mi Um But when I was thinking about the tres leches, you know, most of the times, you know, tres leches, the, the most common accompaniment is fruit, some kind of fruit. So when I did experimentation, I mean, it goes well, you could do any filling you'd like, if you can do with chocolate, you can do with cinnamon, you can do, with whatever you want, but I find that, you know, with the fruit, it just echoes, uh, you know, very nicely. And it kind of ties the traditional, you know, tres leches, and you can use whatever fruit uh, jam you want. But th that's just like the suggestion. But again, if you have a favorite babka that you like, you know, I just, you can make it your own, all right? Okay, so I have here my uh, flour that I mixed with my sugar and my salt. Then I have a little bit of milk that I heated ahead of time. And the first thing I'm gonna do while we talk about it is, um, I'm gonna put it in the, in the mixer. You can do this by hand if you don't have a standing mixer but it's, it's a workout. <laughs> Not a bad thing, right? It's just, so you wanna make sure that the, that the milk is warm, but uh, not warmer than the temperature of your body. That's the best way to tell it. So if it's just like your, your, the body of your temperature, that's perfect. Okay, and then you're gonna put your yeast, your dry yeast, you're just gonna put it on top. 
And then this is just gonna, you should start to see it bubble slightly after a few minutes. And that's just to see that the, um, that it's still alive, that it, you're still gonna be able to, it's still gonna rise. Okay, so then you can just stir it a little bit. It doesn't have to be with a whisk, it can be with a spoon. I just, I love stirring with whisks. And I actually like the dry ingredients. Anytime you whisk, you, you mix dry ingredients for whatever you do, I always recommend using a whisk. That's what's gonna um, mix it much better than, than a spoon or a spatula. Okay, and then I'm just gonna put that in there. And you want to use the, the hook attachment and then you're gonna have one egg and one egg yolk. And you wanna make sure that that is room temperature and that you have your butter room temperature as well, okay? And I'm also gonna get a bowl. Then you wanna lightly grease it. You can use the spray pan or what I like to do is I like to save these pieces of uh, like the butter and you can actually keep them in the freezer. So anytime you, so if you do a lot of baking, uh, that's a good thing to, to have. And, uh, and it, you know, you don't even have to thaw it out. Like, you know, it's, it's so, it's so little that then that's all you can do. And even in a New York uh, kitchen and tiny freezer, you have enough room for little pieces of paper. <laughs> Okay. okay, so again, you can use a spray, you can use a little bit of oil. The only uh, thing that matters is you have, um, that you grease it a little ahead of time. So imagine that's already been there for five minutes. So we're gonna get <laughs> started, okay? I'm gonna move you here. I'm gonna have to kind of hold it while I do. Let me know if you can hear while it starts, because it it's probably going to be quite loud. Oh, it would be good for me to plug it in, right? <laughs> okay. Hold on. So you're going to start at a low speed. And then I crack these right before we started, but you don't have to crack them ahead of time. And you're just going to uh, mix it until it's just they, the, the egg yolk and the egg break a little. And then I'm going to start adding the, uh, the dry mixture little by little. So I'm going to turn down even more just so it doesn't splash all over. Okay. And I'll show you this in a second so you can see what it looks like after I've added all of it, all of it in. Now, there's different brands of flour and each brand, even if it's the same kind of flour, um, you might end up needing a little more at the end just because the, the protein content is different. So I'm just gonna tell you what, I'm gonna show you what you're gonna look for. Okay, so it starts coming together, can you see that? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So then There's we're a question. Yeah. Tiny, can you make this by hand as well? Can you like, you said you can, but it just takes it to work out, right? That's if what you're you If you make to? it by hand, hold on. If you make it by hand, what you would do is you would put the dry um, in your, in like a, in a table, in a flat surface, and you'd make a kind of like a volcano, think of it like a volcano, like a little mountain, and then you do a well in the center, and then you add the liquid. And then when you put the liquid, you would just pull in a little bit of the flour, mix it in, like don't try to mix it all together. So you can definitely do this by hand, it's just gonna take a bit longer. Okay, so now you see it's coming together. I'm gonna stop this so you can see. So, this is, if, if I press it, it's starting to, to come together. You see, it already looks like, like a dough, it's not sticking. So 
I just want to make sure that I don't see any flour in the edges and then I'm going to start adding the butter. It's going to take a, a few minutes. Okay. So I'm going to a hand mixer. Um, if they have um, like a hook, like some of them have, like just make sure if you use a hand mixer, you can use it. But it is if you the standing mixer is the best for this kind of dough. But I feel like if I would almost go with hand first, I would go standing mixer first. If you don't have it, I would use my hands before I would use the, the hand mixer because it's it, it doesn't have sort of the power that you need. Um, but you know you you can definitely use it. I just feel like it's it's you're gonna it's gonna almost feel a little more difficult than if you were gonna do it by hand even though it may sound weird. <laughs> okay, and then um, while that's mixing, I'm gonna show you, oh, actually, that's right. Okay, so. So you see, it kind of came off the sides and it, uh, it doesn't have any flour on the edges, right? Can you see that? And then I'm gonna start adding the the butter. Okay, so while that is mixing, I'm gonna show you because that could take like about, you know, sometimes it can take up to like five minutes. And all you're looking is for all the butter to be incorporated. And um, the dough might be a little bit sticky, but it should be smooth. And then because of the, and then after that's done, and I'll show you what it's gonna look like, we're gonna put it in the bowl. You're gonna let it rise for an hour. Then you're gonna refrigerate it overnight. But you can also, um make it the same day the reason why uh you know a lot of bread or baking recipes have you rested overnight is it allows sort of the gluten to develop and it's going to be at a slower uh, and the yeast to sort of ferment at a slower pace and so it's going to make it you know kind of like a softer dough but you can definitely do it the same day uh, and then all you would want to do is after it rises for an hour, you want to kind of punch it and then you want to let it rise again until it doubles. And then that could take, you know, depending on your space, on, on the temperature, uh, it could take a couple of hours. Okay. So I'm going to take one. This is one I made before. That's my dinosaur jello molds in there <laughs> okay and this recipe makes two loaves okay and this one because i didn't have enough i didn't have enough um room in the fridge to divide them like the say like it says in the um in the recipe so i just put them put it all in one but that doesn't matter <laughs> Okay, so once you have it, you want to bring, bring it all together. It's really nice. We're going to cut it in half. So again, you can divide it beforehand or you can do it all together and divide it in half. Okay. Right. Check on my dough. So I'm curious, Fanny, I think like as all of those things, as you're, you're weaving through all of that, um, and you mentioned earlier your kids. And, you know, I think that one of the, one of the greatest parts about um, this age is because you start to pick up on a lot of things. So when you said that your, your son put on his apron, it's like, okay, mom's ready. I'm going to go, I'm going to do this as well. Um, so I'm so curious, like in that notion of passing down to your kids, um, I'm, I, I would love to know what your for you, you know, having contemplated your identities and, and having it play out in food, what is your favorite, what are some of your favorite parts about being both Mexican and Jewish? And how do you see that passing down? How do you see that love passing down to your kids? 
I think, you know, there's a lot of parallels in both of the cultures. They're both very family oriented. And that's the first thing that I think of. Uh, but there's also a lot of symbolism around the food in the same way that, you know, the round challah, um, you know, for, for, uh, you know for, for Rosh Hashanah or, you know, in Mexico we have uh, bread in a specific shape, you know, to symbolize like the skull for Day of the Dead. So I think, you know, for me, I'm just so excited, you know, as he is getting, you know, again, he just turned three like two days ago. And uh, I just keep thinking about like, oh my God, next year he's going to help me, you know, this year he's going to actually help me form the balls of the, of the matzo ball soup. We do a Mexican matzo ball soup. Um, but even now, like I, since, since he was, you know, very little, uh, just being part of it and connecting him through like, through, through the process of, of um, making what we're making is, you know, you, you start conversation and this is who we are, this is why we do things. And this is, you know, you get curiosity, but also understanding like this is real food, <laughs> you know, and taking the time. And it's one of my, like, I, I work a lot and, you know, no matter what, as soon as I come home, because my time, it's not, you know, I always say it's about the quality of time. Of course, I wish I had more time with him. But as an entrepreneur, it's very difficult. So, you know, I try to make sure that those moments are, you know, as intentional as, as, as I can be. So I put away the phone and, you know, at least for a good hour, we're, you know, doing stuff. And he often, like, we have this, you know, we, we, his nickname is Chilte. And somewhere up there, we have Chilte Spice Mix. <laughs> that now, I don't know what we're going to make with that. But, you know, we allow him to, to explore and, you know, to do these things. And I think that that is a big part of both cultures, you know, to be present, to have. And I didn't have, um, you know, in the way that a lot of both Mexican and, and Jewish traditions are passed on, you know, as you know, through oral traditions passed down from generation to generation. My mother converted into Judaism, so she didn't have those traditions to pass on to me. My Bobby, my great grandmother was an amazing cook, but she passed away when I was very young. And in my grandmother's house, she had a cook that was the one who did the stuff. And I try to get as, as much information from her as I could, but you know, I, I yearned for that. And so I, I in, both, in both cases, so I feel like I, you know, when I moved to New York, I didn't have a place to celebrate eat none of the holidays. So I wanted to become the, so I said, okay, well then I need to create that space and be, you know, the one hosting for whoever wants to celebrate, whether it's part of their tradition or not. So bringing people together. So now I feel like I'm the first generation to pass a lot of these traditions on to, to, to my son, even though they they have echoes from the past, if that makes sense. Let me just see. Okay, that's looking really nice. Okay, so you see that's all come together. I'm gonna stop it. Give me one second. Sorry. Okay, that KitchenAid and that dough is giving me challah vibes. So it's so, right. it's so on brand for the Shabbat event. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> So you start, what, what's nice is like, you see that it, it shouldn't stick to your hand. So if it, fe it should not stick to, once it stops like sticking to the edges, you know, you're getting close. And I feel like it's not sticking to my hand. So I'm not gonna need to add um, uh, more flour, but I do want it to be a little more elastic. So I'm just gonna put it a little bit longer. Okay. Okay, but now I'm gonna show you how to make this to form the, the, the babka. Now, you wanna get your pan. In the recipe, it calls for, uh, it says like to line the pans with parchment paper, but maybe you're like me and you ran out of parchment paper and didn't realize, that's okay. <laughs> so, I also just used my last butter uh, thing because we because of all the <laughs> all the babkas we made uh, so you can use a little spray just a little bit or or damp a paper towel with oil 
You only want a little bit just so it doesn't um, stick to it, okay? So you wanna make sure that's ready before you get started because once you get started, if you know, you kind of always want to start at, at the end um, so that you have everything that you need, okay? Almost ready. Okay. So now you want to lightly flower your surface. Okay. You don't want to add too much flower. And what what I like to do, so I wanted to show you like, you know. I like to, I started my career in the savory side of the kitchen. So I think like a chef, not like a pastry chef, even though I've been a pastry chef for a long time. So what I mean by that is like pastry chefs are very um, methodical. They're very, um, you know, like specific, you know, I like to be able to adapt to what I have. So here I want to show you like, these are two different pans, you know, like two different sizes. And that's okay, you know, you can be like, okay, this one is a little bit smaller. So you could take a little bit of one dough and put it to the other one, you know? And so I just want to, to show you that you don't have one, you have a round one, that's okay. You can make it round too, okay? So what you wanna do is you want to uh, put your pan kind of here and you wanna, as you spread it out, you're gonna thin it out, do it as a, a little bit wider than than the side of your of your pan. It was gonna shrink a little bit, but that's you know like a, a good a good measure. So when you do it, you want to okay, you wanna tap it, like press it, and then you wanna go from the center outside. This goes for any dough that you're gonna roll out. That's the way I I like, I feel you You can do it more evenly. And then you're gonna lift it. You're gonna put a little bit more of that flour that you already have, and you're gonna repeat. When you do this first, instead of just doing that, it allows you to have a more even because when you start like this, sometimes you put a little too much pressure in one. And so this just allows you to, to get it a little bit more even. Okay. Mm -hmm. Almost ready. And then remember this, as you stretch it, now it's gonna shrink a little bit. So that's why I said you want to, um, you wanna make sure it's at least that bit, that, that wide, but you can go a little bit more, okay? And you don't want to go, you don't want to go thin enough that you can see it if, if you can see through it or it feels too fragile, like that it can break apart. That's too that's too much, you know. Okay, so that's good. All right. So after you've done, you want sorry. This, you want to feel, you want to make sure that it's evenly, that it's as even as possible. So, just put this over here. So you wanna grab it, lift it, you know, just feel it, okay? And then some people like to trim it. I don't, I don't think that's necessary, you know? It's okay. Okay, so once you have it, I take this, make sure, okay, it's just a little bit bigger on both sides. Perfect. Okay, so then you're gonna spread. Now here I have, I'm gonna make two different ones. This is like a homemade um, strawberry jam with, um, with rhubarb that I made. But what I wanna show you is, if it's something, especially if it's homemade, and this is without pectin, it can be a little bit loose. 
okay so you can you have two options you can either just put a very thin spread you know because you just because it's really about the milk right you just want like that subtlety of, of um, the fruit but if you're going to use this recipe without the the three milks and you just want to do like a like a jam challah then you can add a little bit you can put it on the stove and add a little bit of cornstarch just to thicken it a little bit um, and since it's a filling it's going to be fine because it's going to continue uh, cooking or you know and then i made another one with these uh the sour cherry spread that i have that i love and i'm, and I'm always like trying to think of you know what to use it with because I, I i cook a lot savory and sweet with it so so then you can use the back of a spoon or you can use something like this like an offset spatula to spread it out And you want to leave a little bit of room in the edges, okay? That's gonna help it come together, okay? So then you're gonna roll it. And then what I like to, what I like to do, I mean, we don't have time for this, but what I like to do is actually put one like the first one you roll, I want to put it a few minutes in the freezer. So when you slice it, it's a little bit easier. So while you form the other one, you put this one in the freezer and then usually when you leave it like, you know, just three minutes, five minutes. But we don't have the time right now, so that's okay. And then you're just gonna, can you see? Uh, we can see, yeah. Okay. So then you're just gonna take your knife and you're gonna slice it in half. And then you slice again. Look how beautiful that is. So then you have the exposed sides. You're gonna make a cross. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah, we can see it. We can see it. And then you're just gonna braid it. Okay, there's no, there's no like, oh, you need to do certain amounts. It's just gonna braid it and then you're gonna pinch the edges, okay? The one I made, my son helped, so it's a little misshapen, but I think that makes it more beautiful. <laughs> oh, I agree, I, I love it. You know, it's funny, I, I think of babka and hala as essentially bread sisters. Um, they teach us so much about patience, and when braiding them, right, I mean, it's, I, I felt so emotional just watching you make that beautiful thing and cut it in half. And there's so much history and intention. Um, and I think that's kind of like a perfect way in which to think about Shabbat and how we are given these moments in preparation to incorporate a lot of those things. So I'm just so curious since you, I just saw you braid um, that hala, like weave it together. What are some things that kind of come up, come to mind when you, when you put all of that stuff together? Like, what are the, what are the intentions that you weave in for yourself? And I mean, even thinking yeah. about the Shabbat, like, what do you, what's, what's on your mind? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, as you were saying that, I, I mean, I, I also think of them as, you know, sisters <laughs> of some sort. I want to show you just really quickly. This is what the dough looks like. It's really nice and elastic and it's just really soft and again nothing in my hand so just put that in your bowl and cover it what well it comes back to sort of what we were talking about before like it makes me think of you know as i'm doing this you know just the the fact that you know there there's actual sort of movement and weaving it's you know part of it is the bridge between my two cultures but i also right now what i'm thinking about is a lot of ups and downs in this past year emotionally you know and how you know like it's like it makes me teary you know to think about especially you know because of what inspired me to do this particular recipe you know and i and so it's it's just these sort of images that keep me going like imagining okay i don't know when i'm gonna see my sister but this is you know we gotta it you know makes me connect feel connected in a in a time when 
when you know there's so much vulnerability and so many uncertainties you know but at the same time you know thinking about the positivity and you know that that's what it makes me think of you know okay so let me go back to this okay so then you repeat the same with the second one okay and then after that you would just cover it with like a cloth a clean one not this one <laughs> um and and you want to make sure when you do this like a lot of people uh, are tempted to put it like on top of the oven or like like right at the stove you don't want to do that because it's it's too hot you know um and so you just you want to be patient and this is something about bread making goes back to what you were saying you know like you just have to be patient and then the magic's gonna happen so so once that's done uh this is what i did yesterday with my son you know see it's a little misshapen but i love it and then um you're gonna get your tres leches mixture so I, I did it ahead of time, but I'm going to heat it up a little. And so this, when when it came out of the oven, I pricked it. But instead of using a knife, the tip of a knife, uh, I like to use, like if you have like one of those thermometers or something very thin so that you don't see the, the holes, then that's what I like to use. And then when you heat up the, the tres leches, the recipe calls for milk or half and half. It just depends on how sort of rich you want it. Either one works. Uh, and then you heat that up with uh, the evaporated milk. And once that's hot, you turn it off and you add the condensed milk. The reason you don't add it all together is because the condensed milk is so has so much sugar that it can tend to burn. Uh, but here I'm gonna keep an eye out to make sure it doesn't burn. Um, and then when you take it out, you add the vanilla, a, a little bit of salt, and if you want, a little liquor. That's optional, okay? And then the, the, the mixture is most likely gonna give you extra for both so what i like to do is you know do a little bit of soak i'm going to show you how you pour it i put it in the fridge um, to let it really soak up and then afterwards i turn it upside down and then i put a little more and it's kind of like you continue doing this until the babka doesn't allow you to like it just won't seep anymore but then you have a little bit of extra to serve it with uh, which is fantastic Okay, so this is hot. Yeah. So the reason we want it hot is because it's gonna allow it to absorb uh, more. Okay, can you see that? Okay, so you're gonna do it like literally directly over it. And at first it's gonna seem like nothing is soaking up. It's gonna be like, oh, is that just gonna dry out? But it's gonna, you know, do it slowly. And then as it as as it absorbs, you add a little bit more. But it's still gonna look wet because you want it to be, and you wanna leave it. The more you can leave it, the better it's gonna be. So again, another step of patience. Okay. So then after this has been done, like soaked for you know a couple of hours, then you flip it over. So I did one earlier. I didn't get a chance to, to finish it yesterday. So this one I started earlier. So I had, I had uh, turned wow. it pretty upside down. And then, oh, this looks so good. I'm gonna put it on a plato. I'm gonna slice it. So it looks like that completely dry. It looks magical. Can you give us? Can you give the the cameras a little bit of a, a close up there? Yeah. <gasps> it looks amazing. <laughs> okay, so I'm making my husband get up. <laughs> get me a plate. Get me a That's plate. Good. <laughs> okay. And, and it's so good, you know, and that's what you want, you know, you, you don't want it, 
because so tres leches cake the normal cake is very porous and it's going to completely seep this is something that is a, it's spongy but it's not as porous but i actually like i love that because it creates a kind of glaze you know and uh so i'm gonna cut a little bit does anybody have any questions about any part of the process Yes, folks, please go ahead, ask your ask your questions into the and chat. I'm happy I like to read to them do, out loud. What I like to do uh, after you slice it is kind of soak it again in like, kind of like if you were making French toast, you know? Yeah. There's a question in the audience from our friend Aida in Miami, and that's specifically around the serving, you know, we you saw I saw it come out of the refrigerator. We saw that you do that. So is this more typically served cold or warm like what what would your what is it's your style like, either, like chilled or room temperature the best way because you're really gonna get the most soak if you like after you do this like that you soak it like that you know so wow individual that one incredible so you want to serve it uh either room temperature or or chilled but uh it, either one works so you could do you know what I love to do is, and again, this is just with the leftover. I didn't even heat this up or anything. This is just like in the leftover of the pan, you know? So I'm just, you get, so that you get, because it's not as porous as this. So this one, it really works best if you slice it up a bit. ¿Qué pasó, mi amor? ¿Qué pasó? ¿Quieres venir? Vente. And then you could serve it as is, right? Or you could even put a little bit of that extra, extra, you know, like filling. Oh yeah. You know, you could put it on the side or you could pour it like if you were, like if you were doing like French toast, but, but it's not <laughs> at all, you know, or even put some fresh fruit, you know, and it's just gonna be, it's gonna be amazing. You know, I don't know if you can tell. I'm, I'm literally salivating. We can see it. I mean, when you pulled it out of the fridge and it had that little bit of a, that crust, like the, the glazed crust, as you said, I was thinking of a glazed donut. I was like, oh my gosh, that just looks- I need to try. To it. die for. <laughs> I think my son is gonna be an excellent babka maker. Okay, you're making it, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling quite jealous over here. Um, mm -hmm. This looks amazing. I, you know, it's so interesting, like seeing you, seeing you um, create this babka. I'm just wondering, I, I love fusion foods and so curious if there's other Mexican Jewish fusion dishes that you particularly love that you also want to kind of give like a, a nod to while we're, while yes. we've got people on this call. Yeah. First of all, the, I make this Mexican matzo ball soup that I've been making for almost 20 years since I moved to New York. This isn't something I grew up with. This is sort of another thing that I did sort of based on nostalgia, bringing both a, a really quick, funny story. So my grandmother had these matzo balls. The matzo balls at my grandmother's house were always very small and, uh, and hard, and I loved them. And then when I moved here and I went to different delis, they had these big, you know, fluffy matzo balls. And I was like, they don't know how to make them. You know, but after about like the sixth or seventh place that I visited, I was like, maybe my grandmother is the one who doesn't know, how to make them. but I actually liked sort of both, you know, and so after a lot of testing, I created a matzo ball that is a little fluffy on the outside. It's not, it, hers are really small and the ones here are like huge. So I do like a medium size that's a little bit soft on the outside with, with, um, with like a harder interior. And then we put the garnish that we put in a traditional Mexican chicken soup, which is cilantro, serrano chilies, lime. Um, the broth itself has a little bit of chili in it just for flavor, not, not so much for spice. Onion, um, eh, lime, and I think I said everything. It's so, 
so good and pulled chicken it has to have the pulled chicken as well so that that is one thing for sure we also do for for the different holidays like at la new yorkina we do a lot of stuff that i'm always excited about like as the different holidays like we did for passover we do this uh, caramelized matzah with mexican chocolate and sea salt um and we do uh rugelach like Mexican inspired arugula. So um, I do like a pineapple and coconut one. And and actually, uh, and we do, and also we do Mexican gefilte fish in Mexico, which is amazing. It's warm, it's pan fried. You use the same, pretty much like the same fish patty. And it's a tomato based sauce, which depending on your house, it's a little bit different. Sometimes it's based on uh, this Mexican uh, uh, dish called pescado la vera cruzana that has like capers and onions and um, olives. In my grandmother's house, it was kind of like sweet, sour, and spicy, but the spiciness came from a lot of white pepper. And I do more like a Mexican based sauce with guajillo uh, chilies and a bit of chipotle. And it's so, so good, but actually, um, we're we're working on at La New Yorkina like in when in uh, for hopefully for Rosh Hashanah and and onwards to create a section that we're gonna call sort of like the Mexican Jewish corner you know like baked goods because we do some of the stuff like I said for the holidays but we crave a lot of the stuff year round that we like even now we do year round we do babka ice cream sandwiches. Um, and so that we ship all over the US. So if you want to crave it, yeah, we do Mexican ice, Mexican vanilla ice cream uh, once. So <laughs> wow, the the ice cream sandwich, I think, is just kind of blew me away. I had to take a oh, you have to, to try it. it. You, and you can we ship we ship all over the US so it can okay. get to you. And that and that um, matzo ball soup rest, uh, that you talked about, it was featured in the New York Times. So for folks who um, are interested in looking that up, check out, uh, look up the New York Times, put in Benny Gerson, uh, matzo ball soup, you'll see that. And if you see in the comments uh, that, that Gail and Loren said, both that gefilte fish recipe and the babka recipe are in the, um, the booklet that, um, that you all received for this nosh on this Shabbat. I also, I feel like I heard some whispers around tamales and brisket. Yes, so we started, because of the pandemic, we had to completely reinvent ourselves because uh, we, we already have a very vulnerable business because the, our primary, like what we mainly do at La New Yorkina are frozen treats. I mean, we do other sweets like cookies and confections and a lot of these sweets that we've been talking about right now. But for the most part, like we are a summer based business. And in the beginning of the pandemic, we felt, you know, we might not have a summer. Like, and so we needed to create something. So we actually launched El New Yorkino um, as, uh, and we launched it with the Mexican Passover menu. And, uh, and we did a lot of the stuff that we do at home um, and we, we did meals that we just stopped uh, only like a month ago, three or four weeks ago, just for the summer. And we're going to start again for Rosh Hashanah. Um, so I think it's quite symbolic that that's when sort of the begin and, and end for us. Um, and we did, and we were like, I want to do a brisket, but I really want, I wanted to marry sort of again, sort of those cultures and this is, and we had been doing tamales to donate to hospital workers and, um, and just people in communities. And I, and I, we felt it was very symbolic for us to do a tamal, uh, you know, for the Jewish holidays. And then it just came, I was like, wait, brisket, ¿Qué pasó, mi amor? Eh, eh, brisket. So we do a traditional brisket. My husband makes it, it's amazing. And then we make a traditional tamal and it's a beautiful marriage. <laughs> it sounds like the most incredible thing, honestly. I love tamales and I love brisket. So it's uh, the perfect, uh, you know, entree dish before all those other sweets that you probably um, headline whenever you have <laughs> as the master sweet tooth of Mexico. Like you must, I, I'd be interested to see how much of your dinner is like sweets in comparison to everything else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I'm lucky that I did start my career in the savory side, and so I was able to tap into the knowledge I had and able to, to you know, 
survived during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. and I, I totally hear, uh, kind of just want to like honor the, the hardships of being a small business owner during a pandemic and especially having two like food specific things that require traffic and people walking by and being outside and enjoying a lot of these things um, really sending I think we're all sending you all the positive all the all the positive Thank vibes you. all the love we want to stay in touch with all of the things that you're doing you're Thank clearly you. a superwoman you know you manage two businesses you do I I think so like you manage two businesses you write cookbooks you have little ones running around um, and all of those things are important and I think what, what I love about tonight is that there's this hyper focus, not just on like food, but also how food is a, a is such a critical part to Shabbat, which is all about rest. So we have this feast we have because we recognize that in order for us to rest and to actually take the time to stop, we need to be excited about it. And Shabbat is an opportunity to get excited about. So with you as this, like I mentioned, the superwoman that I that I yeah. I'm feeling so lucky to be able to be on the stage with. I'm just curious to know on this particular Shabbat, what are some ways in which you're hoping to treat yourself and what are some ways in which you're hoping to rest? Well, you know, I have to say, I, I rarely get to sort of en enjoy like a Sabbath or, you know, like take take that, but, you know, I, I take it, you know, like in, in sort of moments, even if I can't do the whole thing, like I always work on Saturdays being in this industry, like I, I have to. Um, but, you know, we try to take like Fridays and, you know, do, you know, do something. And we're actually moving in a couple of months to, to Brooklyn next to some good friends of ours. So we're already talking about who owned the most amazing. I'm going to give a shout out to them. Middle Eastern company called New York Shook. They have incredible harissa if you, if you, uh, and, and uh, preserved lemon and all sorts of amazing uh, things. And they have a daughter who's six months older than our son. And we're already planning like, okay, at least every other week, like let's try to, you know, cook together or make challah once at our place or babka or whatever it is, you know, it doesn't matter about what it is. It's about, you know, sort of the intention. So even if I have to work on Saturday to have the moment on, you know, with that purpose. And, uh, oh, and I think somebody asked, my husband is also from Mexico and uh, his mother was from New York, but she moved to Mexico. And, uh, and, but we met here. We grew up like 10 blocks away from each other, but we met in New York, so. Wow, that's amazing. That's, so is that the, uh, La New Yorkina, is that you? And is it El New Yorkino him? El New Yorkino was our son. Was ah, our son. yeah. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, Fanny. This has been Thank an incredible so evening. Honestly, uh, we really welcome, we really, I feel so blessed to to feel like the intimacy of your home for you like really letting us in showing us how you make magic happen and really inspiring us to get creative and to make you know life is meant to be delicious so might as well as start with yeah. so let's say <laughs> exactly. yes to cake start with let's dessert. say yes to cake yeah absolutely Just want to make sure nobody else had any questions about anything yeah. before we go cool. there wasn't any questions that came into the chat yet um but yes, any last minute questions, please. I'm getting a lot of love. Thank you. Appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you do make it, which I hope you do, you're going to love it. If you have any questions along the way, you know, send me an email to fanny at lanyorkina.com or share, share your photos. I get really excited when, you know, yes. when people, you know, because I feel like those traditions maybe become some part of somebody else's home and, you know, hopefully yeah, I actually, your own traditions. There are some questions that came in just in this last second, maybe they're quick answers, but it's specifically about how long you keep the babka in the fridge. And if you do it by hand, any other, any other tips? So when you make the, the babka in the fridge, you can make it like, you know, several, like two days in advance. It really is about like, after, when you soak it, let me just clarify that part. So when you soak it, you don't put it in the fridge in the beginning. You just keep it, keep adding it at room temperature until you feel like it's not gonna take anymore. Then you're gonna flip it over and you're gonna do the same thing. 
and then you can put it in the fridge, take it out the next day, and then do one more time. You can warm it, like not, not hot, but warm it up a little more. Again, just because it's not as porous as a normal cake, but that's why I always suggest to slice it, before, like don't serve it whole, um, because there might be some parts that are still dry. So you want to slice it, and then you don't even have to, if you don't wanna go like, in each one, you can literally just pour, you know, the remaining from not just the pan, but anything that didn't make it um, in, in, into the, the actual pan. Does that clarify? And then what was the other, oh, if you do it by, if you do it by hand, I mean, I would just make sure that your, that you, your kitchen is not too hot um, when you do it, because you know, it's gonna be harder to work the dough and you know definitely make sure like the same as with the mixer that your eggs and your butter are room temperature and just know that it's going to take a little bit more time and also resist the urge to add flour it's going to be stickier and you can use something like uh i don't have one right here but something flat like a spatula like yeah Something flat like a spa, like something like this, but metal, you know? Hold on. Yeah, like this. So if you have a bench scraper or if you don't, like something like this to pick it up from as you're kneading it, because it's gonna get really sticky. But if you it's gonna be like much more sticky than if you do it in the mixer and you're gonna want to add more flour, but if you do, it's gonna be too tough. So you wanna just help yourself by, you know, kind of putting this underneath the dough and then that's gonna help you uh, in the kneading process. Perfect. Thank you, Fanny. And I'm gonna, right before I pass it over to Gail, um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you one last question that came in and that's about your favorite ice cream recipe from your cookbook. Oh. That is very difficult. <laughs> um, um, just one? Okay, I'm gonna do one sorbet and one ice cream. I think that's okay, right? <laughs> uh, there's a... Um, there's a sorbet uh, called uh, that, that we have in Oaxaca made with that's very green, but you get it just from like the, the lime zest. And so it's a Oaxacan lime sorbet. So that's one. And then the ice cream is probably um, the cajeta ice cream, which is a goat's milk caramel. And you just can never go wrong. And for those of you who know dulce de leche, cajeta is much better, even though, <laughs> I don't know, maybe Ana Lucia, you disagree because, you know, usually, you know, people outside of Mexico, oh, you know, it's a, they always think dulce, they prefer dulce de leche. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right? See? But because uh, dulce de leche is sweeter and cajeta has this tanginess. So if you didn't grow up with it, like, I can see like why that may be uh, maybe weird, but I just love it. I absolutely love it. Awesome. Thank you so much. I, that's just because I don't know, it doesn't mean I don't want to try it. So thank you for giving me something else to put on my list to, to, awesome. um, to eat and to try. Well, thank you so much, Fanny.